a sepia-coloured imaginary guest house nestled on the craggy, windswept and metaphoric headland. Dressed in an imaginary anorak, phantom binoculars around my goosey neck, sensible hat to protect my twisted septum, you know when I sneeze my snot comes out at right angles, and comfortable shoes for my wide double E feet, I wait for the phone to ring with information of a blow-in, a bird that is seen somewhere it's not supposed to be. I don't like the, the term blowing, frankly. Mr. Mike Carter. Why I don't like it is because it's used by scientists to say, you know, the latest blowing, whereas in fact they're not necessarily the latest blowing. They might be regular visitors, but the birds, we call them vagrants, but they're not vagrants. We are the vagrants. We don't go to the places where they are. And so their birds are normally there. I mean, we're on Ashmore Reef for three days a year. So birders of the vagrants, particularly in this regard to seabirds. I mean, we only go to Ashmore once a year, but every year we go, we get Matsudira storm petrels, Swinho storm petrels, Bulls petrels. Hey, Mike, what were those birds again? Matsudira storm petrels, Swinho storm petrels, Bulls petrels. Well, they're all new ticks for me. I wonder what Pizian Knight says about Gould's petrels. What is Pizian... I mean, where is Pizian Knight? So, they're not blowings. In fact, it's us that are the, the blowings. Uh, thanks very much, we Mike. We are the people that... Hey, I've just got to free up the line. Uh, we're waiting for uh, some calls about blowings. I don't like the, the... term blowing, frankly, actually. Okay, okay. I'll try not to call them blowings. Uh, vagrants. But they're not vagrants. Well, not vagrants we either, vagrants. obviously. We yeah. go, thanks, Mike. We don't go to See you, mate. Place. Back to the guest house. I'm ready to drop everything for bird watching. It's my new passion. Well, preoccupation. Well, something that makes me look more interesting than I really am. I wait. And wait. And wait. For the phone to ring. Waiting is a wonderful hobby for someone with no skills. Of course, the notion of nutty bird watchers waiting in a romantic quaint guest house located on a wet and windy headland. Pants pulled high, eating scones, drinking tea, waiting for the information of a blow-in said blowing again, belongs to a bygone age. A time of timeless cricket tests and when getting a trade was important because you had something to fall back on. Steve Abbott? What? what? Who? Yellow Wagtail? Where? St Kilda? Hmm. What do they sound like? Okay, I'll get back to you on that. According to Pizzi and Knight, yellow wagtail, 16.5 to 18 centimetres. Other names, blue-headed or Siberian wagtail. In breeding plumage, underparts bright yellow from breast to vent. Nostalgia, as we are led to believe, is bad. To feel warm and fuzzy about a time that probably never really existed is delusion and shallow. But nostalgia always makes me feel pleasant, if just for a moment or the time it takes to eat a paddle pop. I love paddle pops. Gay times, splices, triple treats, when they were bigger, are all in my top five, but paddle pops seem to hold the same lure as they did when I was small, so they're my favorite. <coughs> Nothing creates excitement in the twitching world like a bird somewhere it's not supposed to be. Read Mark Cocker's book, Birders, and get a sense of what lengths twitches will go to in order to tick a blow in. Mm, 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 mm. Ah, editing. It allowed me to read that entire book in just a few seconds. Hi, Steve Abbott. Yeah. Crimson Chat. Hmm. Where? Sydney Park. It's not far away, I suppose. What are they selling? Like? Hmm. Tell you what, I'm a bit busy at the moment, but uh, can you get back to me later? Thank you, bye. I don't know whether you're lazy or busy, Steve. Keith Brownwood there. All I had to do was take a few hours out of my day, look for the sensibly dressed people with binoculars, and I would have ticked a crimson chat for my Sydney list. So, if I don't get excited when the phone rings, people will see through me, assume I'm not interested or lack passion, that I'm simply bird watching just because it creates job opportunities. Hello, Steve Over. Who? What? Stephen Moss? Never heard of him. What does he do? Bill Oddie. Oh, 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 Bill Oddie's very successful TV show about birds. He's the producer director of that. You're kidding. Where is he? Okay, where's that? Okay, okay, and um, so is he, is he there right now? 
Okay, yeah, yeah, slow down, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, can you tell him to hang on? Okay, I'll be there as soon as I, I possibly can, yeah. So, okay. Stephen Moss, right? Okay, oh, this is good, yeah. Okay, see you soon, bye. Can I suddenly drop everything to go bird watching? I should be pursuing ways to reduce my Amex bill, renew my wardrobe, or at least buy a belt that fits me instead of finding one in a bin and making extra holes in it with a fork. I mean, I've personally been trying to pitch TV shows, uh, bird bird watching TV shows for maybe the last five or six years, and and I have got very close on occasion, been given development money. But every time I go up on the whiteboard, I get scrubbed off because in the end they say, ah, oh, bird watching, mm, you know, I don't think so. Is it difficult to get a, a TV show up about bird watching? It was at the time. Mr. Stephen Moss from the UK. I met Bill in about 1984 and we talked about he said, you know, I was a junior researcher. He said, well, you know, if you're ever a producer, I'd love to present a series about birding. And we got it accepted 12 years later. So keep trying, because it took us yeah. 12 years. And that was one little series, and it led to another and another. And then Bill started doing other British wildlife, and then we went abroad a bit. And then we started this huge live show called Spring Watch, which started, again, quite small. Started with a few cameras in nest boxes in some gardens in Bristol. And it's now a three-week annual event, and there's two weeks in autumn as well. Just to explain what you mean, you, you lock off cameras cameras on uh, <coughs> nests, I suppose. Inside or... nest boxes. Oh, yeah. OK. We and it becomes little... like a, so a bird soap it opera. Is. It's yeah. Big Brother, only it's not manipulated. We put cameras in a bird's nest. We don't know the next day it might be raided by a squirrel and all the birds get killed. And if, if it, that happens, we show it. Yeah. Um, so this runs for three weeks every spring and we have cameras on maybe 20 or 30 birds' nests. And as the three weeks go on, we find new nests and we stick a camera on them. You is know. this still with Bill Oddie? Yeah, this is with Bill um, and a guy called Simon King who does Big Cat Diary and a very um, wonderful woman called Kate Humble who's a great presenter. So Bill and Kate sit there and commentate on what's going on. You know, And you never know. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Hello, Steve Abbott. Sorry? Bird Fair? What's that? Where is it? Leeton. Mind you, they say there are good things in Leeton. The Bidgee Classic Fishing Competition. The Murrumbidgee Farm Fair. The Leeton of Steadford. The Leeton Agricultural Show. Or simply to view the stunning Art Deco architecture that's apparently there. But for the birder, the main reason is Bird Fair. I don't really understand what bird fair is. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Schultz. Hey Mike, how many people go to bird fair? Probably around about 700 by the time we actually put all the figures together. And most of those people were from around Australia, much rather than simply local people. So it uh, certainly is getting to be a gathering point of bird watchers within Australia to uh, get together and uh, exchange their views and network and listen, learn and get round. As a blow-in, damn, said blow-in again, to the Australian Bird Fair, what's your views on it? Well, it's great. It, in fact, it's very like the British Bird Fair was 20, 25 years ago when it started off. And it started with a tent in a field in the middle of England, a place called Rutland, yeah. uh, which fans of Rutland Weekend Television, which was a spin-off from Monty Python, might remember. It's England's smallest yeah. county. Um, and now the Bird Fair's grown so big it barely f you know, fits into Rutland because it's about 20 huge marquees and 20,000 people come every year. So you're down in Leeton, so if you're down there, you must have gone looking for the Plains Wanderer down there. We did. Um, we went out on Sunday night, just yep. a small group of us, with some powerful torches, not powerful owls, <laughs> and we went out there and it was pretty cold. I'd, I'd been warned that the bird fair last year, the temperature reached 40 degrees, so I'd bought, like, you know, one T-shirt and a pair of shorts. <laughs> you idiot. And I was very, very cold. And I was walking out there thinking, I hope this doesn't take too long. And after about two minutes, I heard a sort of call and I saw what looked like a moth, a giant white moth flying through the air. <laughs> Realised what it was, realised it was a plains wanderer, which is a, a, an iconic bird even to Britons, even us insular Brits who yeah. never know anything about foreign birds are excited by plains wanderer. And I suddenly heard M Michelle, who's one of the rangers there, um, say to me, Stephen, don't step forward. <laughs> Good Australian accent. <laughs> and I didn't. The plains wanderer. According to Pizzi and Knight, 15 to 19 centimetres. The female larger, well, you probably could step on one. They're lankier than a button quail. Slimmer, yellow bill, pale eye, angular head, slender neck, legs yellow, longish with hind toe. They're endangered in Victoria. So uh, it was a plains wanderer. It was 
so close I couldn't focus my binoculars on it. I had to step back and I nearly trod on another one. Uh, and I then thought we they were endangered. Found a female. <laughs> they were. They were, they were, yeah. And then we found a female and I got some pictures of it. And I think it was the most awesome birding experience I've ever had. It was just that moment of intimacy, looking at this incredibly rare bird just sitting looking back at me. So you're calling the Plains Wanderer almost your birding epiphanous moment? Uh, yeah, certainly of this trip, but I, I would say it's in the top five, you know. If, I think it, it has to be one of my desert island birds. I'd have to take it off somewhere. The Plains Wanderer, that's a good tick for me. Saves me a 16-hour return trip to Leeton as well. Although, I used to love family car trips. Loved them. Mum and Dad in the front with me in the back seat to myself. Being an only child meant I always got the back seat to myself. I set all kinds of records for spotting Cortinas, holding my breath the longest, and eating hamburgers in a specific amount of time. I once ate four hamburgers in Glen Innes in less than 10 minutes. My father bet me. How many species are there in the Britain? In Britain, we've got about 230 that breed there, and maybe another 30 or 40 that come regularly, perhaps in winter or autumn. Um, but our list is well, is almost 600 now, because um, Britain is because it's on the edge of a continent, and because we've got such obsessive twitchers, about half our list are not regular birds, you know, which, whereas in Australia, you've got about oh, 800 and something. 840 rest, odd, yeah. yeah look, and, and we're still most growing. Most of those you are see, regular birds. One more thing, Mike, that we're better than English. Yeah. In, we've got eight, what is it, 840, 850? Yeah. You are a bit bigger than us. <laughs> yeah, that's right, in we're many up. ways, yeah. <laughs> Bird watching, passion, mm. preoccupation, yeah. But really, it is creating job opportunities. And if you're back in Australia, you know, and you want to produce a television show with an extremely talented man, please, you know, come and see me. I'll give you a ring. And we don't pay quite as much out here, but, uh, you know, you know. It will be a pleasure. OK. Thanks, Stephen Moss. Thanks, Mike Schultz. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. OK, well, I think I made a good impression on the producer, director of Bill Oddie's TV show there. Bird watching that topic leads to some sort of job. Anyway, it's time to get back to the imaginary guest house on the metaphoric headland in the land of bird brain. Ah, editing. We head for the headland where the unattractive males go. We head Land, where we watch the southerly blow We head for the headland Cause we've got no place to go To be continued